Another broadcast, the regular broadcast of the Church of Christ being brought to you from the building 123 Camel Road, Madison, Tennessee. I'm Don Rudd. This broadcast is being brought to you live. I mean, we're live today. The weather outside is beautiful. I know it is in your section of town or the country. We're glad that you're listening with us. We're studying the book of Revelation, and we're having a good time together. We had good services yesterday. I met a lot of new faces and a lot of new friends. People that have been listening to the broadcast that Brother Rudd wanted to come out and meet with you. We had good services again. One of our very finest crowds. Our Bible classes were full. We had good services last night. And I want to extend to all of you an invitation to come out and be with us if you possibly can. Our building is easy to find. A brick building here on Camel Road, 123. And you're just welcome anytime. Our service is Wednesday night at 7.30. Sunday night at 6 o'clock, Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. This broadcast being brought to you every day from 1.30 to 2.30. We're studying the book of Revelation. If you're ready, I'm ready. So pull up your chairs, get your pencil, get your Bibles. Turn with me to the one of the greatest books in the Bible, ladies and gentlemen. I don't mean that it's any more uh, important than anything else, but it's fascinating. It's a very interesting, intriguing, exciting book. And I, I know that you are all of those things. You're excited about it. We're having a good study. You say, and I like to hear it, Brother Rudd, I understand it. I can see where you're, where you're coming from, what you're talking about. We're now ready for the 14th chapter of this book. So all of you turn with me to the 6th verse of the 14th chapter of the book of Revelation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me back up just a minute before we read it. And say that we're in the second section. Revelation is divided into two parts. The first part has to do with the church's relationship to the civil governments. I'm talking about human governments, the pagan Roman Empire. That empire fell 476, that is the western part of it. The eastern part, Constantinople, fell May the 29th, 1453. Immediately thereafter, we have the Renaissance, or the Reformation movement under Martin Luther, and those men whose works were centered around the Word of God. I'm talking about the translation of the Bible out of a dead language, placed back into the language, the tongue of people, where they could read it and understand it. Now, when this happened, we have what we have recorded in the 11th chapter. God's two witnesses stands up on their feet, and they begin to prophesy. They've been doing this for 1,260 years in sackcloth and ashes, at the end of which time they were actually killed symbolically, and their bodies were not permitted to be buried, but they were lying there in the streets of the cities called spiritually Egypt and Sodom. There they stayed for three and a half days. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this all started in the year 533, at which time the Roman emperor Justinian recognized the bishop of Rome as the universal bishop. That's the beginning of the 1260-year persecution of the church, during which time it was necessary for God to permit her to fly into the wilderness where he had a place prepared for in hiding from the eye, the visible eye of the historian. I had a good brother to ask me yesterday, Brother Rudd, are you saying then that for the 1260 years there was no church? No, I'm not saying that. The Bible said that the church would always be here. Daniel said the little stone would fill, fill the entire earth. And he says that the gates of Hades would not prevail against the building of it, Matthew 16, 18. And he said it would never be destroyed in Daniel chapter 7. But ladies and gentlemen, the persecuting power was so strong, and the great majority of people did not intend to do what's right, that it became necessary for people to worship in hiding. And as far as the record is concerned, the church was in the wilderness. The Bible was stamped out. The Catholic Church chained it to the pulpit. They burned people at the stake for no other purpose or no other reason, no other crime than simply the owning and the slipping around in the dark of night to read the Bible. Now, that's a terrible thing. Immediately at the end of the 1260 years, which would bring us down to 1793, these two witnesses were killed completely. I pointed out to you that this took place probably during the French Revolution under the age of reason, the reign of terror, at which time the National Convention became the statutes of law on the books. 
And for three and one half years it remained there and the Bible was completely outlawed and taken away. At the end of that three and a half days, Revelation 11, these two witnesses once again stood up on their feet and began to prophesy. I'm talking about the Bible personified as if they were two preachers. The old Bible and the new. The Old Testament and the new. They began to prophesy again as they had been doing before for 1260 years in sackcloth and ashes, but this time they received a cordial reception around the world. Over in Scotland, the Haldane brothers. Up in Virginia, the Camels. Down in Kentucky, Martin W. Stone. Round Cincinnati, Ohio, Walter Scott. Way up here in Vermont, James O. Kelly. Down in the Carolinas, in New Hampshire, you have such men as Abner Jones. And I could go on and on. Men that were lifting their voice, trying to get people to return with them back to the Bible. Now, friends, that brings us down to the last of the first section of Revelation. And then we start in this great second part. And that is the relationship of the church to the second beast. The second beast being none other than the corrupted form of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now then, we get down to the 14th chapter. And I want you to turn with me to verse 6. And we'll read here together. Are you with me? And I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven, having eternal good tidings to proclaim unto them that dwell on the earth, unto every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And he said with a great voice, Fear God and give Him glory. For the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the foundation of waters. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is a wonderful thing. This is beautiful. There's a lot of consolation here. I want you to notice that he says that he proclaimed eternal good tidings. Now, the greatest of these good tidings is found in the next verse, in verse 8. And another angel, a second angel, followed saying they fell in, in rapid succession, one angel right after another, as blazing meters shooting across the sky. And he said another, a second angel, followed saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon. What? Babylon the great, that hath made all the nations to drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, ladies and gentlemen, here is the key to the second section of the book of Revelation. And that is the destruction of this city of Babylon. Now, mark it down and write in your margin the key that will unlock the second part. Here is the theme to be encountered as we unravel what we have here in the second chapter of this book. Now again, let me, re let me remind you, let me warn you, that this city of Babylon is a symbolic city. I'm not talking about the old ancient city of Babylon built on the river Euphrates. That city had been destroyed five, six hundred years before Christ. Therefore, he's talking about something else. And may I say to you, my friends, that this is none other than the Roman Catholic Church. The very same thing that John called, uh, or Paul called, the man of sin and the son of perdition in Second Thessalonians 2. The very same thing that John before had referred to as a beast that looked like a lamb that spake like a dragon in the last verses of the 13th chapter of Revelation. It's the very same thing that Daniel speaks of in Daniel chapter 7 when he refers to it as the little horn. It's a persecuting power. Now then, the Roman Catholic Church is referred to as the city of Babylon. Babylon, ladies and gentlemen, it was the city of confusion. Here's where God confused their tongues. And here is where all the confusion and the chaos started in the religious realm. And here is where it is seated, and here is where it must be destroyed. God said, look it, and a second angel followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great that hath made all the nations to drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there has not been a country, there has not been a nation on the face of God's earth that has not been contaminated and guilty of adultery with the Roman Catholic Church. Nations are still doing it around the world. And ladies and gentlemen, they, as well as she, will be destroyed as a result of the fornication here. Now notice he said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great that hath made all the nations to drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Follow with me. Verse 9. 
and another angel, a third following them, saying with a great voice, If any man worship the beast and his image. Now, what beast are you talking about, Brother Rudd? The beast spoken of in Revelation chapter 13. Turn back there and you'll find two of them. The first beast is the pagan Roman Empire. The second beast is the papal Roman Empire. The first one had to do with the Caesars. The second had to do with the popes of Rome. Now then, when the second came up, the first one had received a death stroke. Now the second demanded all the nations and the tribes and people upon the earth to make an image of the first one and to bow down and worship it. But God said, Woe, hear me now, woe unto every man that worshiped the beast and his image and received a mark on his forehead or upon his hand. We've already found out that this mark is spoken of in the 13th chapter. All of you, hold your fingers right here in verse 9. Turn back with me to chapter 13, and we'll begin reading in verse 15. And it was so given unto him to give breath to him even the image of the beast. There you are. No doubt about what we're talking about. That the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as should not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he caused all the small and great, the rich and the poor, the free and the bond, that there be given unto them a mark on the right hand and upon their forehead. Now, ladies and gentlemen, listen to me well, if you will, please. Pull up your chair. Don't let these fellows around the country scare you and say that there's going to be a time when there will be a mark, an invisible, uh, indelible ink that's stamped before your head that can only be read under some kind of a, uh, an ultra-ray light or a black light, and that's the mark of the beast. That's a bunch of trash. And that's a bunch of junk. As a matter of fact, it's nothing but write down Tom Foolery. And I don't care how many of your weeping jimmies say that. This is not so. Now listen to me. The mark of the beast is the mark of a man. He has a number. His number is 666. The man has a name. His name is Latinus, who was the founder of the Latin Empire. And we reduced his name to numerical value of the Greek letters, and we come up with the word 666. Now then, to extend the right hand of fellowship to the fact that they may be the right church is receiving the mark on the right hand. And if you give mental assent to the fact that the Roman Catholic Church or any of her daughters could be the true church of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are guilty of receiving the mark of the beast. Now look in verse 9, and you'll find that he said that if any man worship the beast and his image and received a mark of his forehead or upon his hand, he shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is prepared unmixed in the cup of his anger. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke and their torment goeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day and night. They that worship the beast and his image and whosoever received the mark of his name, here is the patience of the saints. They that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus uh, and the faith of Jesus. Now, ladies and gentlemen, don't rail at Don Rudd. Don't lift your voice in opposition to what he's saying. Now, you can accept it or you can reject it. There is a hell, and it's prepared for people like you who refuse to accept the truth of Almighty God. All of you sectarians, listen to me now, and I love your soul and I'm saying it. All of you sectarians are worshiping the beast, and you're going to be punished in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone from the presence of God forever and ever. Now, someone says, Rudd, that's a powerful, straight statement. I want it to be straight, and I want it to be powerful. I want you to know, my friends, that if you're in it, you're going to be lost. That's how simple it is. And to be in it is to be a member of the Roman Catholic Church or any of the sectarian bodies that came out of it. Now, if you can't understand what I'm talking about, listen to me well. I'm talking about the Baptist Church. I'm talking about the Methodist Church. I'm talking about the Presbyterian Church. I'm talking about the Lutheran Church. I'm talking about the Nazarenes, the Baptist, the Southern, the Missionary, the Free Will, the Primitive, all of them. Now, that's what I'm talking about. Now, if you can't understand that, my friends, just sit back and relax. You don't have to worry. You're going to get by with the babies and idiots. Now, that's how simple it is. Now, you can't get any plainer than that. Now, let's get here. 
And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a great voice, If any man, now there's no exception to the rule, if any man worship the beast and his image, well, brother, I don't like it, not interested in where you like it or not, this is what the Bible said, and received a mark on his forehead and upon his hand, he shall drink, it didn't say he might, he said he shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. There it is. I'm telling you straight, my friends, that's exactly where you're going. You're headed to hell if you don't get out of that mess. Now, the same thing is true with my brethren who are messing around in the true church of the Lord and preventing all of these sectarian trends to creep in. You're going to be lost with the rest of them. And my friends, that's it. Someone said, don't like hell, fire, and brimstone. Turn your radio to some other station then if you don't like it. Now, this is how simple it is. We're not going to play games. I know it. And you know it, and the God of heaven knows it. I'm reading directly from God's law. Look at here. Someone said, someone said that this is prepared, mixed in the cup of his anger. Someone said, Brother Rudd, you get too mad when you preach. Well, the Bible says that God has a cup of anger right here. Look at here. Turn with me to 15 chapter. Look at verse 1. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having seven plagues, which are the last, for in them is finished the compassion and the love and the sentimentalism of God. That's not what it said. It said, in them is finished the wrath of God. You know what that is, Joe? That's anger. That's what it is. And the Bible said it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. Now, ladies and gentlemen, don't think that God is one of these goody-goody individuals that just can't stand to send people to hell. He doesn't will that any of us be lost. But I can assure you, the Bible being true, the great majority of God's creation are going to be lost in spite of everything that God did for us. You understand that? The Bible said that broad is the way and wide is the gate that leads to eternal life or eternal hell. And very, very many of us are going to go in it. Straight is the way, and narrow is the gate that get, leads to eternal life. And few, F-E-W, few will enter in thereby. Now, my friends, I'm trying to pick my words carefully. I'm trying to be just as plain as I possibly can. I wish to God if I had the power to set you on fire where you couldn't set where you are. Because I'd rather set you on fire now than to see your souls burn in hell forever and ever. Now then, the Bible says, that this is tormented, or you're going to be there tormented with the wine of the wrath of God, which is prepared unmixed in the cup of his anger. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels. You mean, Brother Rudd, you believe it? I believe, my friends, there's a place where the worm never dies. I believe there's a place where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And I believe there's a hell, and I believe it's hot. And I believe it's burning with brimstone. And I believe it's right where the holy angels can look down into it and see it. It says there, in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb and the smoke, there you are, of their torment goeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day and night. Who? They that worship the beast and his image and who receive the mark of his name. Now, do they have any rest? He said they have no rest whatsoever. Someone said, Brother Rudd, I thought this was figurative speech. I thought that was symbolic language. You want some liberal language? Turn back with me into the book of Matthew. Matthew, let's see what we said. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 46, And these shall go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. There you are. Where shall they go? They will go into eternal punishment. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what does that mean? I think that that means exactly what it said. That is, there's going to be weeping and nailing the gnashing teeth. But someone said, Brother Rudd, that verse didn't say that. No, but the 51st verse of the 24th chapter does. Listen to it. And the Lord of the servants shall come in a day when he expecteth not, and in an hour when he knoweth not, and shall cut him asunder and appoint his portion with a hypocrite. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There you are. Now back to Revelation. Here is the patience of the saints, they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, let me challenge you here. 
Let's get rid of all this old silly, sickening sentimentalism that we call love. And let's get down to business and understand what God demands. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you don't keep his commandments, you don't love him. That's how simple it is. If you don't love him, you're against him. Jesus said, you're either for me or you're against me, one or the other. You cannot be both. You either love him or you hate him. You cannot be indifferent to him. That's how it is. That's how simple it is. Here is patience. Let him hear. Verse 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Lord, that they may rest from their labors, for their works follow with them. My friends, I wish that I were not exegeting the book of Revelation right now. And I would stay right here with you for two or three hours and I'd talk about death the grave and hell and what it means to die in the Lord. Personally, I'm not too hepped up and I'm not too much in love with this world. I just don't find too much that interests me here anymore. And I know that there's a better world. I go to the hospitals and I visit the nursing homes and I visit the convalescent homes and I see people that are, are suffering, they're in torment, they're weeping, they're crying, they're suffering terribly day and night. I see people that are unhappy. I see people that are hopped up on drugs. I see men that are down in the gutters on alcohol. I see women that are weeping their eyes out because of broken homes. I see children that have no parents. I see parents who have no children. I see old people that are neglected by their children. I see children that are too busy making a living to have any familial relationship whatsoever with their families. They're almost the thing of the past is natural affection anymore. But the Bible in the midst of all of this says, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. God said, speaking through Ezekiel, As I live, as saith God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But my friends, we can, we can rest assured that when we die, our spirits will fly into Abraham's bosom. We will be taken there by angels. We'll not be dragged there against our will. There's a better world. There is no sickness. There is no sorrow. There is no death. All of this distortion that we can see in our bodies. Look down, my friends, now at those arthritic fingers and legs and hands that may be twisted and contorted right at this moment. There's a place where all of that will be remedied, my friends. Think about the pain that you have within your body that's shooting from one end of it to the other. There's a place where there will be no pain. Wipe those tears from your eyes because there'll be no tears over there. There'll be no sorrow. There'll be no death. Think about it. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. But my friends, you can only use it you can only appropriate it. You can only enjoy it if you're in Christ. That's to be in His church. And you're baptized into it. If you're not baptized, you're outside the ark of safety. You cannot have any of the benefits that He speaks of right here. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. For henceforth, yea, saith the Spirit, they may rest from their labors, for their works follow them. Listen to me. Verse 14. I saw... And behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud I saw one sitting like unto a son of man, having on his head a golden crown. Isn't that wonderful? I'm talking about Jesus, no doubt about it. And in his hand a sharp sickle. My friends, listen to me. Not only is he holding something, but the Bible said it's a sickle. Not only is it a sickle, but he said it's a sharp one. It's a sharp one. And another angel came forth out of the temple, crying with a great voice, to him that sat on the cloud, send forth thy sickle and reap. For the hour to reap is come, and the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud cast his sickle upon the earth, and the earth was reaped. My friends, there's going to be a day, just as certain as you're listening to the sound of my voice, there's going to be a day in which God will reap, and we will reap, and God will reward and our will reward will be according to the deeds that we've done in our body. Now, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. There's going to come a day of reckoning. There is a day of judgment. And Paul said in Hebrews 9, 27, It's appointed unto man once to die. But 
but after death, the judgment. The Bible said that he's seated here on a cloud. He has a sickle in his hand, a sharp sickle. And the Bible says the voice out of heaven said, Now is the time to cast the sickle upon the earth, for it's time to reap. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that's something else. That's a fearful thing to think about it when you think about it. Now, the Apostle Paul, over here in the Second Corinthian letter, makes the statement that every man, every man, will give account for the things that he's done in his body, whether they be good or whether they be bad. Now, my friends, that's a fearful thing. That's a fearful thing for us to fall unprepared. All right, let's watch him now. And he, he that sat on the cloud cast his sickle upon the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel, in rapid cessation, came out from the temple which is in heaven, and he had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, and he had power over fire, and he called with a great voice to him that had a sharp sickle, saying, Send forth thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth. For her grapes are fully ripe. Figures of speech. Symbolic. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, this world is review, uh, pictured here as a grape vineyard. As a vineyard. And all of us as clusters of grapes. And it's now time to gather them. Now watch me here. For her grapes are fully ripe. The end of the world is now come. And the angels cast his sickle into the earth and gathered the vintage of the earth and cast it into the bright wine press, the great wine press of the wrath of God. My goodness. Look at what he says. The wine press of the wrath of God. In other words, there's a great big old press out here. Great big container. And it's full of the anger of God. And you and I, as the vintage of the earth, as these grapes are going to be cast down in there, and the wine press was trodden without the city. There you are. And there came out blood from the wine press, even into the bridles of the horse's mouth, as far as a thousand and six hundred furlongs. My friends, that's a whale of a lot of punishment taking place outside the city, outside the church. In other words, this is hell fire that we're talking about. This is the judgment day. You talk about solemn. You talk about solemnity. Here it is. Take off your shoes, my friend, because we're upon sacred grounds. Don't you think? Don't you think that you ought to recon reconsider your condition? Are you ready to prepare? Are you ready to meet God unprepared? Are you ready to be ushered, my friends, into God's presence, never having been baptized into His precious name? Are you, my friends, nervy enough? Do you have enough nerve to face death and to go into God's presence unprepared? If you do, my friends, you've got a whale of a lot more nerve than Don Rudd's got. Look at verse 1, chapter 15. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having seven plagues, which are the last, for in them is finished the wrath of God. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I never read this, and I dare say that I've read this hundreds and hundreds of times. I never read this verse, but what cold chills literally trickle up and down my spine. Because I have come to the very end of all of God's dealing with man. I saw another sign, great and marvelous, seven angels having seven plagues. You read the King James? It says seven vials, Brother Joe. All right, there you are. Having seven plagues, which are the last, for in them is finished the wrath of God. My friends, we're coming down to the end of the world. We're count this is what you call the countdown. Now notice the key, the theme is verse 8 of chapter 14. Fallen, fallen is Babel in the grave. Everything from this point on is showing us how this old city of Babylon will be destroyed. Everything in it will be destroyed. Everything that's connected with it will be destroyed. Every person that commits adultery with it will be destroyed. And it's going to be destroyed in these seven plagues right here. Now listen to me well. We pointed out that when the little book was taken out of God's hand in the fifth chapter, it was sealed with seven seals. And when we got down to the breaking of the seventh seal, there were seven trumpet angels. When we got down to the seventh trumpet, that was the end of the world. And then, my friends, we pick up the last seven angels right here. And these are what we call the seven plagues of God, the seven vials or the seven bowls. And he says that when this is over, this is all. 
there is no more. For in them, in these plagues, is finished the wrath of God. Now, ladies and gentlemen, listen to me well, if you will, please. I'm talking about something that's real. We're talking about, again, God's throne. God is real. He exists. He lives in a certain place. I don't have any doubt whatsoever that it's right in the center of this great universe, that everything in the world is revolving around it. I've already described it to you when I got to the fourth chapter. We went back into the book of Daniel. I went into the sixth chapter of the book of Isaiah. We read the first four or five chapters of the book of Ezekiel. But very briefly, allow me to say, my friends, that according to all of these passages, as we pick them together or piece them together, a little here, a little there, we find that God's throne is encased in the rainbow. A complete rainbow. It's completely encased in it. And on that throne, God is seated as the universal sovereign. Now, he relinquished that power when Jesus came to him, and Jesus is now there on David's throne at God's right hand. Outside of this are 24 other thrones, upon which are seated the 24 elders, six on each direction, in each direction. Immediately thereafter are the four creatures, one like a lion, one like an ox, one like an eagle, one had the face of a man. And then intermixed, in, in, interwoven, entwined, we have the seven spirits of God. And in close proximity there too, the Bible says there are 10,000 times 10,000 angels. That's 100 million plus thousands upon thousands. That's too many to number. Now, ladies and gentlemen, immediately according to Revelation 4, I want you to get the picture well. This is not my speculation. I have not permitted my mind to vary. I have not permitted my mind to wander. I'm telling you what the Bible says. Immediately in all direction from God's throne is an enormous, immense, enormous and immense sea of glass. As far as the eye can see, there it is. Now, according to this, underneath it, it looks like there's flames of fire because the sea of glass is mixed with fire. Way, way out yonder are enormous walls, and in these walls are huge gates. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that's where God lives. That's where he is. Here's where we are now. Read with me. Chapter 15. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that come off victorious from the beast, look at there, they don't succumb to the Roman Catholic Church, and from his image they don't fall for civil governments, and from the number of his name, they understand the 666. You understand? There they are, standing by the sea of glass, having harps of God. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, O Lord God the Almighty. Righteous and true are thy ways, thou King of the ages. Who shall fear, O Jehovah? Who shall not fear, O Lord, and glorify thy name? How can anybody not do it, my friend, if they understand it? If I could paint you the picture, if I could make you see it as vividly as I see it now, every one of you would fall on your face and begin to worship the Lord and glorify His name, for thou only art holy. For all the nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy righteous acts have been made manifest. Isn't that beautiful? And after these things I saw, and the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. My friends, that's where God is. That's where God is. Hold your finger there. I've got to do it. I didn't mean to, but I've got to do it. Turn back with me to the fourth chapter of the book of Revelation. Let's look at it again. I almost get carried away. And after these things I saw, and behold, a great door opened in heaven, and the first voice that I heard a voice of the trumpet speaking to me saying, Come up hither, and I will show thee the things which must shortly come to pass. I want to see them, my friends. I want to see them. I want to hear them. Straightway I was in the Spirit. Behold, there was a throne set in heaven. There you are. And one set up on the throne. I can see it. You can see it. We are permitted to look at it. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper stone and a sardis. And there was a rainbow round about the throne like an emerald to look upon. Round about the throne were four and twenty thrones. And upon the throne I saw four and twenty elders set in array in white garments, and on their head crowns of gold, and out of their throne proceeded lightnings and voices of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. 
and before the throne as it were a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about it, four living creatures full of eyes before and behind. And the first was like a lion, the second a calf, the third the face of a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures have each one of them six wings full of eyes round about and within, and they have no rest day and night. Ladies and gentlemen, look at those creatures. Look at them standing there. There they stand. They have wings falling almost to the ground. And in those wings they have six pairs of eyes. And all around the outside, on the inside, there's just rays of eyes like neon signs. Look at there. And they have no rest day and night. Holy, holy is the Lord God the Almighty who was, who is, and who is to come. And when the living creature shall give glory and honor and thanks to him that sitteth on the throne, to him that liveth forever and ever, the four and the twenty elders shall fall down before him that sitteth on the throne and shall worship him that liveth forever and ever and shall cast their throne before their crown before the throne, saying, Worthy art thou, our Lord and our God, to receive the glory and the honor and the power, for thou didst create all things. Because of thy will, they were and were created. Now, ladies and gentlemen, isn't that beautiful? I'm talking about something that's real. This is not an apparition. This is not a figment of some wild preacher's imagination. I'm talking about a divine book. I'm talking about God's law. You understand that? Now, my friends, I want you to turn with me back into the book of Ezekiel. Will you take just a minute with me, please? We want to talk about Ezekiel. Look at here. We have a picture in the first chapter of the four cherubims that stand before God. Let me let me share it with you. Now it came to pass in the thirtieth year and the fourth month and the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captains of the Kibar, that the heavens were open. There you are. The heavens were open, and I saw visions of God in the fifth day of the month, which is the fifth year of the king Jehoiakim. Captivity of the word of Jehovah came expressly unto Ezekiel the priest. There you are. What did he say? The hand of Jehovah was there upon me, and I looked, and behold, a stormy wind came out of the north, a great cloud with a fire unfolding itself. Look at there. And a great cloud with fire unfolding itself, and a brightness round about it, and out of the mist thereof, as it were, glowing metals out of the mist of the fire. And out of the mist thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their likeness. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the same thing that we've got over here in Revelation 4. They had the likeness of a man, and everyone had four faces, and every one of them had four wings, and their feet were straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkled like burnished brass. They had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides. And they four had their faces and their wings thus. Here they are. Their wings were joined one to another, they turned not when they went. They went every one straight forward. My friends, there is no direction. There is no distance. There is no space. There is no time in heaven. I have no trouble with this. As for the likeness of their faces, they had the face of a man. And they four had the face of a lion on the right side. And they four had the face of an ox on the left side. And they four also had the face of an eagle. And their faces and their wings were separated above. Two wings of every one were joined one to another, and two covered their bodies. And they went every one straight forward where the Spirit was to go. They went. They turned not when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire. Like the appearance of torches, the fire went up and down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright. And now the fire went forth lightning, and the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. My friends, I'm talking about something real. I'm talking about these heavenly creatures that stand before God day and night. This is what John is speaking of here in Revelation chapter 4. As I beheld the living creature, one wheel upon the earth beside the living creature, for each of the four faces thereof, the appearance of the wheels and their work was like burial. Four had one likeness in their appearance and their work was it was a wheel within a wheel. My friends, some of these days, I'm going to exegete all this to you. We'll get over here in the book of Ezekiel, and I'll cover very minutely all of this, just exactly like I'm covering the book of Revelation, and we'll understand it. You talk about beautiful. Turn with me to the sixth chapter of the book of Isaiah while we're back here, if you will, please. Please excuse my diversion. But when I start talking about heaven and the throne of God, it's almost impossible to get away from it. In the first year of the King Uzziah, I'm talking about Isaiah 6, 
I saw the Lord set it upon a throne, high and high lifted up, and his train filled the temple. There's a temple up there, ladies and gentlemen. I don't have words in my vocabulary to describe it. Above him stood the serpent. Each one had six wings. That's what Isaiah said. That's what Ezekiel said. That's what John said. They all saw the same thing. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. With two of them he covered his face. And with two of them he covered his feet. And with other two he flew. He did fly. One cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is Jehovah of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundation of the threshold shook at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. My friends, the Bible says that it's going to be a frightening thing to hear the voice of God. When God came down to speak to the Israelites on the top of Mount Sinai, the Bible said that two million Israelites fell back. And they cried to Moses and said, We'll not hear him. We cannot stand his voice. We can't stand it. Paul said in the last chapter of the book of Hebrews that we have come to a new Jerusalem, another mountain that cannot be shaken with hand. I'll read it to you in a minute. Look in verse 5. Then said I, Woe is to me, for I am undone, because I'm, in a, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King Jehovah of hosts. Ladies and gentlemen, there is not an instance, and I challenge any man to tell me, there is not an instance in the Bible where any mortal, any mortal man ever came face to face with the eternal that he did not fall down in his face as one dead. Listen to Isaiah. He says, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with a tongue from off the altar. And he touched my mouth with it, and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sins forgiven. I don't have any trouble, ladies and gentlemen, with this. I don't have any trouble with going into God's presence, but God's going to change me. He'll change you where we'll be able to stand there. Look at that. My sins and my iniquities will be taken away. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall ascend, and who will go for me? And then Isaiah cried out, Lord, here am I, send me. Isn't that wonderful? Turn to Isaiah chapter 59, 1 and 2 while we're here. Those coals of flames touched his lips and cleansed him from all of his filth. Now, but ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't do that to everybody. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 59. Behold, Jehovah's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save. Neither is ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you so that he will not hear. There you are. Your sins. That's the only thing that can separate you, my friend. While we're here, turn back with me to Isaiah chapter 1. And let's read it. Verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, saith Jehovah, though your sins be as scarlet. There they are. They shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Are you willing and obedient? Ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with a sword, for the mouth of Jehovah has spoken it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that's how simple it is. We can go to heaven. We can see God. We can live with Him forever and ever. We're not going to back in the back door, my friends. We're going to have to get ourselves right now. Turn back with me to the book of Revelation now. I'm in the 15th chapter. Look at here. And after these things, I'm verse 5 of Revelation 15. And after these things I saw, and the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony of heaven was open. That's where God lives, ladies and gentlemen. I have no doubt that both the tabernacle in the wilderness and the temple built by Solomon, by Zerubbabel, by Herod, is a reflected copy of of what God has and where He lives in heaven. Here it is, the tabernacle. The temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. Isn't that wonderful? We can see it. What came out? And there came out from the temple the seven angels that have the seven plagues, what they look like. They were arrayed with precious stone, pure and bright, and they were girt about their breasts with golden girdles. And one of the four living creatures, having unsaid unto the seven angels, that had the seven bowls full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever, and the temple was filled with the smoke from the glory of God, 
and from his power, and none was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels should be finished. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about something real. We're talking about something here. You can see it. There's nothing mysterious about this. This is a real place. These angels came out of God's temple. It was filled with smoke. They got a work to do. God said, do it. And I'll reserve this place inviolate. Nobody will enter it until you do your work. And when you do it, then, of course, I'll let people enter the heaven. Someone said, Brother Rudd's in in heaven yet? No. Nope. The Bible said that nobody can enter that until these seven plagues have poured out their vials. All right. Now, ladies and gentlemen, listen to me very, very carefully. My time is passing away. And I heard a great voice out of the temple speaking to the seven angels, or saying to the seven angels, Go ye and pour out the seven bowls of the wrath of God into the earth. Now, ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. The theme is verse 8 of chapter 14. Look at it. A second angel followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, that hath made all the nations to drink of the wine of the wrath of fornication. Every one of these vows, every one of these bowls, every one of these seven angels right here are commissioned to do a part in the destruction of the city of Babylon spoken here in verse 8. Understand that? In other words, every angel here is doing his part to fulfill what John said would happen right here in verse 8 of Revelation 14. Now get it, brethren. What is it? He said, come up here, and I want to show you something. Fallen, fallen is Babylon. Now he saw it fall right there before John's eyes. But ladies and gentlemen, don't confuse what John saw with the actual fulfillment of it. He was seeing pictures. In other words, he saw a, a, a city that looked like the city of Babylon. And it fell right there before his eyes. And then he goes back and shows us the elements, the agents involved in the destruction of that city. You see what I'm talking about? Now, what were these agents? There were seven angels. And they had seven great bowls or seven great vials. In other words, they, they fly up on top of this city, above it, and they just dump their bowl out. Bowl number one. And then he turns around and flies back to heaven. And then, of course, here comes the second, carrying another great big bowl just like that one. Dumps it, pours it out, turns around, goes right back. Here comes the third one, has a bowl, dumps his bowl. Now, every time he dumps a bowl, something happens to this city. It takes seven of these bowls, ladies and gentlemen, to complete the destruction of this old city of Babylon. Now, are you with me? Have you got the picture? Now, I want you to notice that the 16th chapter of the book of Revelation is nothing but what he says would happen right here in verse 8 of chapter 14. That is, the city, I'm talking about the Roman Catholic Church, I'm talking about the old heart, I'm talking about Babylon the Great. Someone said, well, Brother Rudd, you lost me. How do we know that that means it? All right, brethren, all right. Take your Bibles now and turn with me to the 17th chapter, and we'll see. And there came one of the seven angels that had the seven bowls, now, they've already poured out. He poured out his 17th in verse 17, the 7th and poured out his bowl. But now then, he must be explaining what he's talking about in chapter 16. And one of the seven angels that had the seven bowls that spake with me say, Come up hither, and I will show thee the judgment of the great hearted that set upon many waters. Now, let him do this is a parallel verse to verse 8 of chapter 14. In other words, this old harlot is the same thing as this city. But we've got a different picture here. You see that? Here it was a city, here it's a woman. With whom, look at here, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and they that dwell in the earth were made drunken with the wine of her fornication. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman setting upon a scarlet colored beast, full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stone and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abomination, even the unclean things of a fornication. Get the picture. Get the picture. And upon her forehead, a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great. Now, don't tell me that I don't know what I'm talking about. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the city of Babylon of verse 8 of chapter 14 is the same thing as the harlot seated upon the scarlet colored beast of chapter 17 and he calls her Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abomination of the earth. You see it? Joe, you got that? All right, here we are. And upon her forehead a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abomination of the earth. Now, my friends, listen to me well. Listen to me well. The Roman Catholic Church is this old harlot, this woman of verse 3. I saw her sitting upon a scarlet-colored beast. What is that? That's the combination of church and state. That's political powers. The revived Roman Empire. She was full of blasphemy. Now, the, 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 the beast had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple, scarlet, decked with gold, precious stone, pearl, and in her hand a golden cup full of abomination. In other words, she was drunk. What was it? Abomination. And upon her forehead a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great. There can be no doubt, ladies and gentlemen, that the Roman Catholic Church is spoken of right here, but I ask you a question. I want to know if the Catholic Church is the mother, who are the daughters? That's what I want to know. Who are the daughters? You want me to tell you who the daughters are? The daughters of this woman are her offsprings. Where did the Baptist church come from? Came from the Catholic church. Where did the Lutheran church come from? Came out of the Catholic church. Where did the Presbyterian church come from? Came out of the Catholic church. Where did the Methodist church come from? Came out of the Anglican church, which came out of the Catholic church. There is not a sectarian body on the face of the earth that didn't come out of the Roman Catholic Church. But the Roman Catholic Church is the mother, therefore the sectarians are the daughters. And what did he say? Come here and I'll show you that they're going to be destroyed. What is the abomination of the earth? The harlots and her daughters. There they are. If you could, del if you could eliminate them from the earth, you could eliminate all the abominations of the earth. Someone said, Brother Rudd, you're too hard on the sectarians. Can you be too hard on the abomination to the earth? Now, the Bible says get rid of the old harlot, get rid of her daughters, and you'll eliminate the abomination to the earth. Now, my friends, you little preacher friends better listen to me. You better listen to me. You better take inventory of your lives and your preaching. You know that you're piddling. You know you're playing. You know you're nothing but a bunch of pipsqueaks and paddywhacks that don't have enough nerve to preach. You better either start it or you better get out of the pulpit. All of this soft, soap, and pussyfoot and stuff is not going to get it in the day of judgment. And all of you weak need spineless brethren that set back as a bunch of leeches and suck the blood out of this kind of stuff, you're abominable in God's sight. You nauseate him to his stomach and he'll spew you out in one of these days. You're headed to hell, my friends. You better think twice. Look at him now. And the woman was drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with a great wonder. And they said unto me, Why do you wonder? I'll tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carried her, which had the seven heads and the ten horns. There's your, there's your interpretation. Where is the theme, Brother Rudd? Verse 8 of chapter 14. Turn back there. I'm going to hammer this in your minds in, until you see it when you close your eyes tonight. The second section of the book of Revelation, the theme is the destruction of Babylon. What is Babylon? It's the heart. What is the heart? It's the Catholic Church. What does she have? She has a bunch of daughters. What are they? They're the sectarian body. And when you put her with them, what do you have? You have the abomination of the earth. There you are. And what does God do? He commissions seven angels to destroy them all. There you are. Verse 8. You're going to hear it tonight, my friends, when you go to bed. You're going to see it in the morning when you wake up. You're going to see it every place you go. The book of Revelation is never the same again. We're opening this book. You can understand it. Don't tell me that the God of heaven didn't mean for us to understand it. Don't tell me that we're not doing it right. I don't know. I don't know where it goes, but up there on the wall, the clock says, Mr. Rudd, your time is gone. I appreciate you listening. We've had a good study. I hope you've enjoyed it. 
Now, I'm saying that this broadcast is brought to you live every day from the meeting house of the Heritage Church of Christ, 123 Camel Road, Madison, Tennessee. I want you to write us. I want you to call us. When I finish Revelation, I want to get in the book of Daniel. We'll open up the telephone lines again, and you'll have the privilege of calling in the Bible questions you might like. As a matter of fact, my friends, here's what I've been thinking. I think that I'll have about two or three days at the conclusion of Revelation. Listen to me well. In other words, when I finished it, I think I will open up the telephone lines to you and, and ask you to confine your questions to anything in the book of Revelation that you might not have understood that you'd like to have me to speak of just a little bit more. And then we can solidify this thing, you see, as we go along. But until I talk with you again tomorrow, at the same time, this is Don Rudd saying, have a good and pleasant afternoon, ladies and gentlemen.